So we are really glad to see you in the framework of the Sketches Subculture project. Uh, could you please share a little bit about yourself and your studies of subcultures? Uh, well, I'm a historian. Uh, I work at the University of Reading in the history department. Um, and I got into, well, I've, I've always been interested in music and subcultures growing up. But um, in my work, I decided to... Um, to look at them seriously because I thought from a historian's perspective not many academics were doing so. Um, There's quite a lot of work in sociology and a lot in uh, cultural studies and political science but there didn't seem to be much from a historical point of view so I decided to look at the 1970s and 1980s and I was interested in the relationship between youth culture and politics and uh, the, the broader changes of that period particularly from a British perspective, as the old, the post-war consensus, it was called, broke down and the emergence of Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism. And it seemed that youth culture um, could be looked at in an interesting way when considered in relation to the broader social change of the, of the time. So that, that was my way into it, really. Uh, tell me, please, what approaches do you use to study subcultures? What are the obstacles in the actual investigation of a certain subculture? Okay, well, again, my approach was historical, so a historian's approach, really. And what I was interested in was uh, looking at what did the people involved in these cultures say and do at the time? So I wasn't trying to project my, a theory onto them, and I wasn't trying to kind of um, uh, analyze them from a top-down point of view. I was trying to build a history from below. So construct a history through the sources, through the records, through the fanzines and the magazines and the writings and the posters and the artworks that were developed at the time. So my the book I wrote on punk, um, No Future it's called, and the various articles I wrote were very much geared towards trying to capture how people were trying to make sense of the world at the time before they knew what happened next kind of thing you know when when it's when the change is in, in is fluid and and is uh, transformative but not known and so my, my approach was to kind of go back and yeah look at what people said and did what the songs were about um how people put their put their punk artworks together or their music together the spaces they inhabited um, the things they were thinking about that um, predominated their idea, that, that kind of thing. I didn't really, f I guess one obstacle was making sure that I had enough information from the vast range of um, creativity that came out at that time and that it wasn't looked at from a single perspective. And so when I talk about youth cultures or subcultures, I tend to them as being contested spaces, ways in which the uh, spaces in which people can um, debate and argue and have different opinions about the way in which they can, what they mean and the way in which they come, come together. So my take on punk was that it was a contested culture in which there are various plural punks um, with lots of different meanings, but really what binds it all together was this notion of doing things yourself and being and having a kind of critical engagement with the world that was around you but you can apply that basic basic method i think to most subcultures thank you very much for your answer uh some of us do you use maybe photography or video recording when you study subcultures uh yeah um i didn't i didn't when i was doing my historical research although i did use you know i looked at photos and I looked at film that was made at the time so I think it's a brilliant resource and I hope people keep photographing and and uh, and recording and filming uh, things forever really just to, to keep it. it's really useful what I did do I did a project look at I come from a, a city in England called Norwich which is on the east of England and part of my project I did was to look at how punk manifested itself in an out of the way small British city and um, to do that, um, I gathered together lots of people's ephemera, the photos that they'd kept under their beds for years or, you know, the um, uh, posters they'd kept but not thrown away, fanzines that have been hidden in garages and lofts and stuff like that. I put together an exhibition uh, and there's a website now that I, I help 
uh, puts up called Punk in the East, in which we gathered together everybody's ephemera. And for that, we had a we had a night where we did an opening of it, and we got a band to play, and we got invited lots of people down. We filmed that. We made a film of it, and it was brilliant because you had film of people what they look like now, you know, forty years after what they looked like when they were teenagers, talking about how what it meant to them that the culture they'd helped create and that no one cared about particularly at the time suddenly was you know being recognized and validated um in this exhibition in this uh, event so that that was really good and, that, and i filmed that and that was a way in which we filmed to kind of capture the the trans the transition i guess of of youth culture to uh broader culture you can't really call it youth culture when they're all in their 50s or 60s anymore so but that was good <laughs> by the way are they still punks a lot of them were or certainly identified as punk if you if you watch the film i'll send you a link you can see a lot of people still dress in a certain way they're, they're kind of giving off the signifiers of being of being punk um and nearly all of them still identified with the with punk as an idea or a stimulus or a or a, a, a transformative moment in their lives this is very interesting. Uh, how do you think, why it is necessary to study subcultures? Um, I think because they, well, the, there's lots, I think there's probably lots of reasons why they're important. The one that are interesting for me is because I think if you add the youth bit to it, the youthful part of cultures, they are the way in which young people at a particular moment of their lives, that bit between being a child and being an adult makes sense of the world. And I think youth culture is a way in which you can experiment with ideas, with identities, with um, style, with politics. And so it, it's a really kind of formative cultural space. And I think that's a, a really good way of, and from a historian's point of view, but also from a social scientist's point of view, of understanding the ways in which people young people make sense of the world that they're part of and, and grapple with the fault lines of 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 the, their time and place so i think it's important for that reason i think it's also from a more kind of um what's the right word um kind of, i don't mean this but kind of higher level is that um it it's important because of the way in which the world has changed since we've had the mass media has become such an important part of our lives and mass culture and popular culture and the way in which that informs how people understand themselves and their place place in their world and often youth culture has a a really quite um ambiguous relationship i think with the moments of mass consumption and popular culture and mass media that they kind of it's important for youth culture because it captures it and it informs it but it, there's always this struggle against it being appropriated and codified and ossified as a result of of media attention so i think that's quite interesting uh, as well so i think it tells us a lot about how people grow up and how people understand their place in the world and also because it's a great space for creativity which is always worth looking at yes this is very interesting uh, tell me please what relationship subculture have with popular music and social change that you mentioned before yeah with well music is I, an, an awful lot probably most uh if we, i'd have to think this through if not all uh youth subcultures or subcultures uh have music as a, a an integral part of them um it's interesting how some subcultures can appear before they adopt the music. For example, the te British Teddy Boys in the 1950s are associated with rock and roll, but Teddy Boys existed before rock and roll existed. So they adopt the music as, as their soundtrack of choice over, over time. So I think there's um, music provides a soundtrack to that identity and becomes music also exists in certain spaces doesn't it in clubs and cafes and play it's it's part of the atmosphere of of life and i think there's, there's this connection between them i'm trying to think of a youth subculture that doesn't have music as an integral part of it and i can't so i think yeah and again that that's interesting about the relationship with um with mass consumption and and uh media culture in terms of social change i think kind of going back to what i said earlier about i think it's 
useful about social change because on the one hand youth cultures that space where people are understanding the way the world is changing around them and so it um, helps you see what are the priorities what are the concerns what are the aspirations of people at a certain time and how they how they perform or articulate or manifest that culturally but also at the same time there's always that question of uh, what's driving what does the change does the cultural changes instigate the social change or does the social change instigate cultural change and i would see it as a kind of symbiotic relationship you know it, it's both uh, all at the same same time but I think by honing in on youth and subcultures, you can kind of you can create a kind of case study of that process of social change. It wouldn't ever be definitive, but it might tell you an awful lot about something in the way that case study in any discipline can tell you an awful lot about bigger pictures, broader pictures. As I know, your research is currently focused on the links between politics and youth culture in late 70s and 18s Britain. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you think, is there any difference between politics and youth culture today? Uh, yeah, I mean, the politics have changed. The context is very different. So there are, so, so there are differences there. I think each each the emergent i'm very interested in the way in which youth cultures form and the way in which they take a while to coalesce into something recognizable once they've formed they then develop their own evolution they often disperse into you know sub scenes and sub genres and they transform over time and that will relate to 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 broader changes um so if you take punk as an example punk today is different to punk in the 1970s there's still things that are the same there are continuities but there are also big big differences particularly technological changes uh, mean that it's almost another another time and place i mean virtual media and all that kind of thing completely transforms um the context context i think but in terms of youth cultures and subcultures still providing a space for people to ask questions to self-create themselves to um to uh, become uh, be artistically express themselves and all that kind of thing. I think then the parallels are, are clear. It's still a vibrant and uh, creative space. Uh, you said that uh, your study is based how uh, the subculture formed. And um, the next question that I want to ask you is what, how do you think, what is the reason why subcultures emerge? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really difficult question and i think different subcultures will have different stories to tell or different interpretations uh for it i think they they help fill a, a gap in that if something's not there in someone's life or someone's experience then subcultures are a way of of, of filling that vacuum creating meaning or, or or allowing for ex expression the, the form that will take can change over over time and, and depend on varying factors but i think they think they do that again it's that question of what's driving the change so technological changes can create cultural changes so something like i know the the emergence of uh dance culture around musics like techno and stuff you know couldn't have happened prior to the technology being created but once you've got sequences and samplers drum machines and all that come into affordable play then people can get hold of them and create something new and and different which then uh, people coalesce around so i think it's a really complicated question really really difficult and any subculture you you look at there'll be different permeations i think uh, matt you are co-founder of interdisciplinary network for the study of subcultures right yeah co-founder i'm a co-founder yes we do it very collectively mm -hmm. could you please share about activity of this network yeah i mean it started in about 2011 um and it began because me and a couple of other people who were historians were doing what i said earlier we thought we'd like to use history as a way of looking at youth culture and subculture but we noticed that most of the research done wasn't in history, it was in sociology. And so we got in contact with 
people who looked at subcultures from different disciplines and we met up a few times and we decided to hold a conference and we held a conference uh, in London in 2011 and we were really surprised we put out a call for papers and literally hundreds of people from across the world uh, came to it and so we kind of after that we kind of formalized the network a little bit and the idea of the network is really to create a conversation or a dialogue across academic disciplines but also outside of academia as, as well so the network incorporates people who are musicians people who align to various subcultures and youth cultures journalists writers as well as academics and so the whole idea was it was it was meant to be quite open-ended we don't really have a formal structure to the network we just kind of maintain it as as we go so we, we have got a book series with palgrave macmillan um, which we're, and you know if people want to publish with us we're more than helping to uh, open to looking at ideas and proposals we have a facebook site uh, which is where most activity goes on day by day where people just post things or questions and it's a really good way of people meeting people or knowing what's going on uh, research wise or just finding out about stuff we get lots of students posting there saying are there any old skinheads from the 1980s who will talk to me about my research and they'll they'll kind of come in and have a conversation um so that that's good um and we try and help over the years we've done the odd event here and there it's been difficult in covid times but we we've heard held the odd event every now and again based on a theme and if a conference comes up that's like your conference for example it'd be the kind of thing um me or somebody else would say let's suggest a panel and we we'd, we'd ask if we could come and give a selection of papers on something or and things like that so we just try to keep up it's a kind of it's a it's a uh, what's the what's the word? i don't want to say brand it's not a brand it's certainly not really that but it's a kind of umbrella term we've put the net, the subcultures network in order to facilitate conversations and dialogues and, and instigate research around the subject. Thank you very much for your answer. It is very interesting activity. The next question is about, uh, you know that all subcultures have their own myth, some certain idea. Mm -hmm. And these subcultures that you study, what type of myth or again they have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, you're absolutely right. All these subcultures have myths and those myths uh retain don't they over time I mean, punk has lots of punk has myths that it was you know that it almost it shook the british establishment and it was you know this revolutionary moment it's got the myth that it was a year zero that everything before it was uh made um irrelevant and that punk started everything afresh there's the mythology around the stories of some of the bands like the clash and the sex pistols and stuff so it's full of full of myths and like most myths there are grains of truth and there's a, you know there's a there's a kernel of uh, of reality there but also they get emboldened and uh, and transformed over time and they become they become useful in some ways and that uh, people kind of rally around them and it, it allows for a sense of commonality but they also i think weigh very heavy on youth cultures and i think uh, there tends to be that um, tension within subcultures between those who were in it at the start and those who come into the subculture a little bit later on about, you know, uh, the kind of the, the keepers of the myth, if you like, the kind of the keepers of, of, the, of the flame. But yeah, they, they all have a myth and, and mythical places as well, like Northern Soul always talks about the Twisted Wheel Club you know, uh, in Manchester where people went to listen to Northern Soul. So it, there's this mythical mythical space in Manchester which existed and it was there but I wonder how what the reality of it at the time was compared to the way in which it's romanticized uh, nowadays. Uh, based on your practice of studying different subcultures what can you say about their structures? Is it usually some kind of hierarchy? Do all subcultures have the same structure or are they different? That's a good question. Um, I, I always look at subcultures as being very diffuse. Um, I think it's why, I think one of your questions might have been about this in the email you sent me about, you know, um, what is, you know, defining the term subculture. It's a really difficult word to define because by their very nature, they are loose and amorphous and they don't really have set boundaries you know that you recognize it when you see it but it's it's very hard to 
fully determine. Um, so I think any hierarchy, I mean, you can use old Pierre Bourdieu here, can't you, and talk about cultural capital and the way in which people can accrue cultural capital and those who uh, uh, were part of that formative creation of a subculture have a certain status which they they embody and they kind of maintain uh, throughout their 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 lives and even after they've they've, they've died or, or whatever so i think there are kind of there are kind of informal hierarchies and statuses within subcultures how far they impinge on somebody's day-to-day -day existence of of, uh, of performing a subculture or existing within a subculture i'm not sure but they're always there they're always kind of part of the discussion and part of the part of the identity i think but yeah no so i wouldn't say hierarchies formally exist but they do exist when people from subcultures intermingle and um, come together thank you very much matt maybe you can add something to the theme of subcultures that i didn't ask but you want to share i mean i think it's a great area to to look into i think there's lots of difficult questions like defining what we're talking about is a difficult question the fact that youth cultures um suggest something very age related but in the reality what you know subcultures are now something that don't necessarily pertain to youth or a certain age group i think that's that's quite is in interesting the technological shifts i think are important to to taking it taking place um the mythologies that's a good that's a good thing i also think um yeah i mean the, the, what i'm looking at, at the moment are fanzines so i'm interested in the kind of ephemera of youth cultures not necessarily the things that are well known like the the records or or um or notable items of clothing but the the things that ordinary if you like ordinary people do when they align or have an affinity to a, a subculture what they do and what it means for them and i've been reading hundreds of punk fanzines and it's really interesting the different ways in which people understood what punk meant how punk looked very different in certain parts of the country to other parts of the country and how people get really enthused by subcultures for about a year and a half and then their enthusiasm wanes and they start looking at something else so that that cycle of commitment i think is a really interesting aspect of of youth and subcultures and i guess more broadly just the way in which you which they fit into a broader context you know uh, they don't exist in a vacuum they don't exist in a bubble they're a part of broader forces and processes of social and socioeconomic and political change and so all those areas i think are really uh, interesting and useful and then there's the personal politics as too how they relate to people's gender their sexuality their race and the relationships more broadly with society on that level are you know there's tons of ways you could you can look at it i think thank you very much for your answers thank you for this interview thank you see you later